addressing the diversity of leadership structures in education. And I'd like to begin by simply acknowledging the lack of diversity. Um, my focus today is on school leadership, but this extends to other arenas. So whether we're talking about publications and education journals, about the discourse we see in the media about education, or about government policymaking, um, there are voices that simply just aren't being heard. Um, it is rare to see the diversity that we have in our classrooms mirrored in the upper levels of management. And there are many structural reasons for this. I'm sure that most schools, if you're to look at them from top to bottom, that overall, when you look at staff members, there are more female than male teachers. In leadership teams, we know that in primary schools, the leadership teams are more female heavy, with males still overrepresented. In secondary schools, males are definitely overrepresented in relation uh, to the number of staff members, and most likely the principal or the headmaster of your school is going to be a white male. So why does that matter? Um, in the end, we should recognize that this can affect pupil outcomes, that pupils are not seeing the faces, uh, their faces reflected in the authority figures that they grow up with. Um, and my focus today is to give you simple tools in your school to ensure that women and Black, Asian, minority ethnic group voices are heard and empowered. And also to point out some of the common pitfalls uh, that come about when we're talking about diversity. Um, fostering diversity can avoid many barriers and missed opportunities that exist naturally in our school ecosystem. And it's really important to note the difference between numbers and the way that people look at quotas and numbers and diversity and voice. Um, international schools, for instance, are a really great example of that uh, because they have more diversity on the books. So they might have more minority ethnic group uh, staff members. But it's important to remember that what this looks like in reality is that we see these staff members concentrated in enclaves. In the UAE, we tend to see this in the Arabic and Islamic departments. And those are kept separate from the leadership structures of the school. So it's really important to not look at numbers, but look at voice and who has it, especially at the top of the school. This is just one example. Um, diversity in race and gender are just two aspects, and this can be problematic. So it's problematic just for two key reasons, okay? The first is that we know that voices at the top, when they work in isolation, don't always make the best decisions. In fact, we know uh, that teams make much better decisions than individuals, and diverse teams have much better outcomes than homogenous ones. In fact, the more diverse your team is, the more you are likely to hear dissenting opinions, to have friction, uh, and for those teams to thrive. Diversity drives innovation, and it results in better outcomes. If you need to point this out in your school, um, there's kind of two places that I'd suggest that you can kind of look first. The first is uh, the McKinsey and Company Diversity Reports. They started doing this in 2015, um, and it was really to kind of look at how companies can develop an imperative uh, to look at diversity. And they interview uh, hundreds of people from 600 different companies. They survey over a quarter of a million people um, to look at how diversity can not only drive better outcomes, increase profit, but also bring about innovation. And these studies and case studies are just fascinating to read. Another place where you can go is look at how teams are set up and train team members to look at collective intelligence. There are amazing collective intelligence studies done by Carnegie Mellon and MIT. Um, they're just, they're psychological studies and sociological studies, and they're just fascinating to read what happens when you have a whole bunch of people working in groups and seeing how diversity can change that. It is important that we look at diversity because a lot of the times in school, we can suffer from groupthink and uniformity. And we know that groups can kind of falsely feel confident when they are homogenous. Sometimes you can be very, very confident that you're on the right track and doing the right thing and making the best decisions because no one is disagreeing. Diversity is a way to make sure that you have other voices in the room. 
And I think what's important to recognize um, is that people do care about diversity. Um, I was interviewing a panel of head teachers a few years ago, and they were, it was an all male panel of head teachers. And one of the questions I asked was about females in leadership. And they all said that it was a priority in their schools. And I trust them, like they said it with all sincerity. The issue is, is that middle managers do not feel that diversity is as important. It's not a priority for them because middle managers, quite often, they're between rungs. Um, and for them, they have so many other things to worry about that diversity doesn't really come to the forefront of their minds. So that's the trick, making diversity really important for middle managers. It allows different voices to, again, rise to the top. So how do we find di diversity? Um, the typical advice is to have these voices in the room and then just have them speak up. So you put a whole bunch of people in a room and you make sure that those people in different groups speak louder and lean in. Um, and this is typical advice. I'm not sure if you can see here, this typical advice that's given to minorities um, to talk over interruptions, um, to be resilient and not take no for an answer, to sit at the head of the table. Um, and this is all really interesting, but it's very ineffective. And it's ineffective for two key reasons. First, this type of behavior isn't conducive to building a great team. It doesn't foster collaboration. And it kind of says that we should be rewarding aggressive behavior. The second reason that this advice is flawed is that it puts the onus on women and minorities to do all the hard work and heavy lifting. It charges them as the individuals in charge of solving larger organizational problems, um, that they should be fighting a battle to be heard and that the burden's on them. And it's not. It's the job of managers to create conditions for different voices to be heard. And in addition to that, the school's policies, its structures, its processes, and its institutional culture should create those opportunities. Um, so when we take a look at, let's say, uh, the burden for inclusivity to fall on minority groups, the emphasis, uh, the emphasis should not be on people changing themselves. It should be on school structures. A great example of this is the timings of meetings. So this is on a macro level, um, ensuring that women, for instance, aren't all leaving after school because they have to take care of children, that there are opportunities for meetings within the school day, or even better, that there are after school childcare and crash opportunities at the school so that women can fully partake and be in the room for these meetings. Um, there's no one size fits all. Different strategies can work for different schools and organizations. Uh, the macro changes are looking at who gets to be in the room in a meeting and sit at the table. Micro changes are looking at how we can make those tweaks to meeting them, meetings themselves. A lot of the times, intuitively, we think, okay, as long as we have diverse members in a team, that means that the outcome will, will be diverse. Um, round robin feedbacks won't cut it when it comes to changing culture. Neither will tokenism. Um, stop counting how many women are in the room and instead look at where the power and the voice in the room resides. Um, I'm sure that it's very easy for one person to be loud and to override a lot of other voices. Why is that? And how can you delegate that authority and that decision making and that power to many different voices in the room? And here's some way to start. Uh, one of the first things that you can do are focus meetings. I'm sure that we've all sat in on SLT meetings where the agenda tends to be bloated um, and people are giving their impressions as to what's on that agenda quite, quite quickly. And sometimes agenda items that are quite important don't get the attention that they deserve. What can be done instead is you have small focus meetings, which means you take an agenda item and you don't have a big meeting with lots of people. You give that one specific item to two or three people to focus on and come up and act upon it, to come up with the recommendations and then they are empowered to make decisions and act. Uh, they do this at Apple. It works incredibly, incredibly well. Um, you make the meeting small and very targeted. Um, and then there's more space for voice within those small meetings. It doesn't mean that those two or three people make all the decisions. They also have the opportunity to talk to stakeholders. They can go interview them. 
The problem with having a big room, a big meeting with a lot of different voices is that sometimes you put someone in a position to represent their group as a whole, or they have to come up with something on the fly where they might already be uncomfortable. They might feel like an outsider. They feel like they don't have as much power or status as someone in the room. They might be speaking English as their second language. So for all those reasons, having one-on-one -on -one time to interview and then collect the nuance and detail that you need to give a really, really good um, outcome, um, that's really, really important. Having those dissenting voices and really seeking them out is key. Um, I can't tell you how many um, IT and tech and teaching meetings I've been in where the most important person in the room is in there, and that is someone who hates technology, who hates being on Zoom. That person is really, really key. The, the person that doesn't like something, you need their opinion and find out why, because otherwise you will lack buy-in. But also you won't see the challenges and barriers that people that people need need to partake in. Other ways that we can really change how we get feedback are changing the feedback loops. Right now, I know that we are all obsessed with Google Forms. We send them out all the time and they're great. It's a, it's a great fast way to survey people and get feedback. However, it is very one-sided. Um, I send in, I feel like my voice is going out there, but I don't necessarily see anything um, coming back. Um, what's really interesting also is that when you have minority voices, they will, when the form goes out to everyone, be drowned out by majority voices. So Google Forms are interesting, but they, there's better and different ways that we could switch this up. Um, you can do fishbowl groups with inside and outside circles to share ideas. You could do note stays, which are really fun, where everyone just comes with an idea or two that they've maybe developed, and they just throw it there and present. Uh, you can do dare to ask sessions, where you just have senior leadership team members um, standing up on stage, and you can interrogate them town hall style uh, to get an understanding of how decisions are being made and to give direct feedback in the moment. Another great tool is to completely do away with PowerPoint presentations and instead look at reading during a meeting. Uh, this is something that's used in Amazon. It's fantastic. Um, and it basically means that you have the death of the one charismatic voice. So the one person who with one authoritative statement can dismiss things and get them out of the room. Um, what's really great about presenting instead of reading is you can use those small focus groups. They go out, they come up with some recommendations, and then in the meeting, what they can do is then just have everyone sit and read a six-page memo that they have spent weeks preparing with lots of evidence and facts. And everyone just sits and reads in that meeting. And that way, they're not coming in with preconceptions. They are not kind of forming cliques ahead of time about what they think about this or that. They don't have to pretend that they've read an email beforehand and then just kind of blather on. But instead, you have a very in-depth discussion with better evidence before you. And it's very empowering to give people that mode to present. Um, it allows them to kind of have fully articulated thoughts. And it takes them away from the nervousness of the situation. It's it's a more nuanced approach to initiatives. Another thing that you can do, which is terrifying for people in SLT, is increase access and transparency. We live in the age of shared drives and Google Docs, and that should be fully embraced. embraced. Um, agendas and minutes should be shared all the time, whenever possible. It is fantastic to see that cross collaboration. So if I want to read the science department's minutes on their meetings, that will help me as an English teacher or as a geography teacher and so on. Um, and then SLT, making sure that their decisions aren't happening in a vacuum at the top. You can see the reasons that they are having these decisions made or the, the processes that they're going through. And then also you can ensure that people then can feedback effectively. Um, and that's, that's really, really important. You can make it easy for people by having consistent structures for agendas and minutes throughout the school without being too prescriptive. Uh, but there's something really powerful about sharing. And that also means that we can automate and share data. Um, automating data so that you get reports that are emailed to teachers that are in their inbox so they feel empowered uh, to make decisions and create interventions in their classroom. Really important that data is shared as well, that we don't see knowledge and data kind of confined to one gatekeeper. Um, you want to avoid that whenever possible. 
Um, the other things that you can do, which are really, really key, are pointing at plans. So within meetings, you don't ask a person their, their opinion. Instead, you take the plans, like the architect's plans, you put them on the table, and you discuss those so that people aren't feeling defensive or entrenched in a position. Um, it's more discussion-based and collaborative to kind of take out this is our school improvement plan and then you look at the different sections of it without having any names attached or ownership but instead you look at it holistically with different pieces that everyone can kind of address you discuss ideas not positions and again there's power and collaborative documents there as well um and then this is something that i love amplification i know that i said earlier that the onus shouldn't be as on individuals in a meeting um to kind of change an organization but amplification is just a really really fun kind thing to do so if you are a woman in a meeting and another woman in a meeting says something um what you can do to amplify that is to simply say helen just made a really great point about differentiation helen could you kind of expand on that a little bit did you guys remember Helen's point about differentiation? That comes in here too. Did you put Helen's point on differentiation in the minutes? Because uh, I think that's really worth coming back to at our next meeting. <laughs> so by amplifying, you make sure that the person gets credit. You don't necessarily even have to agree with the person, but it is confidence building for people in the room who normally aren't in the room as well. And what that comes down to is also creating psychological safety. Psychological safety is really, really key. Um, and it gives a space for many voices in, in, in creating and making decisions. You can teach middle managers SCARF so that when they are diagnosing problem areas in their team, they're looking at things like status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. Um, you want to evaluate barriers that stop people from being in the room. You want to build trust uh, from many different voices in the school that people feel heard. Um, and overall, what that will do is you will create an environment where you will see creativity thrive, um, where you will see more friction and you will see more dissension, but decisions will be made in a robust and rigorous manner. And that's important because that will force your organization to become more agile, flexible, and definitely more innovative. Um, so these are my key takeaways. And um, that's all I have for you today, but I hope it's been a little bit helpful in looking at how you can create spaces and more voices that are diverse at the top end of the school.